Journey IFC strives to create safe spaces to worship God. Know that you are welcome just as you are, regardless of religious background or lack thereof, skin color, political affiliation, sexuality, age, culture, or any other label you own or society throws on you. You are welcomed and celebrated here just as you are. Hi, I'm Paula. Hi, I'm Paula. I'm visiting from Aztec, New Mexico. Yay. But I am a journeyer and I probably will continue. My little piece of paper says buscar. Is it Spanish? Seek or find. Okay. I'm sorry? It means to seek or to find. To seek or to find. So that is the actual title of the buscar. Yeah, buscar. The reading is the message translation of Psalm 42, and it's very American, so you won't understand. As the white-tailed deer drinks from the creek, I want to drink God, deep drafts of God. I'm thirsty for God, alive. I wonder, will I ever make it, arrive and drink in God's presence? I'm on a diet of tears, tears for breakfast, tears for supper. All day long, people knock at my door, pestering, where is your God? These are the things I go over and over, emptying out the pockets of my life. I was always the head of the worshiping crowd, right out front, leading them all, eager to arrive and worship, shouting praises, singing thanksgiving, celebrating all of us, God's feast. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying blues? Fix my eyes on God, soon I'll be praising again. God puts a smile on my face. This is my God. When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you, from Jordan depths to Hermon Heights, including Mount Lazar. Chaos calls to chaos to the tune of white water rapids. Your breaking surf, your thundering breakers, crash and crush me. Then God promises to love me all day, sing songs all through the night. My life is God's prayer. Sometimes I ask God, my rock solid God, why did you let me down? Why am I walking around in tears, harassed by enemies? They're out for the kill, these tormentors with their obscenities, taunting day after day. When is this God of yours? Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. God puts a smile on my face. This is my God. What a beautiful rendition. Thank you, Paul. That was beautiful. So inspired by that reading, um, I was drawn to a song called As the Deer. Is the song like that? Oh, there it is. So um, I invite you to rest into this space. You can say seated if you want. You can stand. Whatever feels better for you. We're not high church, so we don't have to be on a pedestal or anything. So do whatever feels comfortable, but um, let us sing to death for
There'll be some examples of why uh, Bruce Gar is at the top of all of our leaders' guides today. But first, I want to give you a little insight into how our soul team works here at Journey. And I actually wanted to share how we decided on our latest series on hope. For those that are new to our faith community, or that have been here a while and have forgotten, our soul team is a group of volunteers who meet periodically to dream up ideas, to nurture the spiritual health of our community, and plan what we do on Sundays. We are a small but mighty crew. It's my favorite meeting I say every time. We're small but mighty, and we meet typically on Zoom, and we always begin with a simple check-in, just, hey, how's your day going? What's going on? At Journey, that can take up to an hour. I know that because it happened today in our book study. Um, it did take us an hour to get to our check-in, which is great and good. I love that. Um, but we'll start with this check-in, and then we move on to some ideas that has bubbled up in any of our lives, ideas of themes or topics that we could talk about for our series. And often, we actually are inspired by the check-in to figure out what our series is gonna be. For example, this last meeting, we all checked in with each other, and there was a repeating theme that many of us were having a bad day. A rough day was going on, I'm getting some nods from this whole team, or even a rough couple of days. And so we showed up and we just shared that, and we were honest and vulnerable, and we realized that we were not alone in this feeling we had of having a bad day. And even beyond that, many of us in our faith community, and even beyond that, many around us in the world are also having a rough go of it. Something about fall seems to bring this on for me each year. This collective feeling of dread kind of impedes into our lives. The days slowly get darker and colder, which honestly I'm excited for in a sense. <laughs> but at the same time, our schedules get busier and busier, and we have so much ahead of us in regards to holidays and the election season and school calendars. It's honestly intimidating knowing what is to come in the next few months. And even now, as we enter into hurricane season, we see the devastation that is caused by the effects of natural disasters like we're seeing in Florida, in Georgia, and North Carolina. I want to name that today as we hold the people who are affected by that in prayer, especially from this most recent hurricane. I think it can be easy to get down in the dumps, as our scripture said, as the seasons change and as things get more and more chaotic. It can feel easy to become hopeless when we look around the world and we continue to see people suffering from war and natural disasters and divisiveness. Therefore, when one of our salty members, Mary, I'll look at you, started listing off ideas she had brought to the table, something in me came alive whenever she mentioned the word hope. That was it. That was the first idea was, I want to talk about hope. And after a long day that day, I was eager to hear and think a little more about hope in my life. So we decided that we were going to take some time and talk about hope as a faith community because I think all of us can use it right now. And if you're into that, we're going to be talking about hope, gives you that similar spark, know that this is going to be for you too. Personally, when I hear the word hope, my mind immediately jumps to Advent for some reason and the Christmas season. You know, the thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices as that Christmas hymn goes. Hope is usually included in the list of Advent themes along with faith and love and peace. But I think that hope is deserving of an entire series, not just one Sunday in December, right? So for the next month, we will sit in hope. And to begin this journey into hopefulness, I was drawn this week to the work of a theologian named Jürgen Moltmann. Or Moltmann, I don't know, I'm going to get it wrong. But Moltmann was born in the late 1920s. He actually just died um, this past June. I was looking him up and I didn't realize that. But he was raised in Hamburg, Germany, and was thus present to the beginnings of World War II right in his backyard. He was spared his life during the bombings of Hamburg in the 1940s, but many of his classmates were killed. And he was left wondering, why am I not dead? Or you could say, why am I still alive? Moltmann says that this experience, along with eventually being captured by Canadian soldiers and put into a prison camp, which honestly he wanted, that was a good thing for him, that experience made him wonder about the significance of his life and his relationship to the divine. Why was he still around, and what did God have in store for his life? 
So when Moltmann was freed from his prison camp, he went to study theology, and he eventually became a professor of systematic theology and one of the like greatest theologians of our time. And in the 1960s, after years of teaching, Moltmann wrote a book entitled A Theology of Hope. This was in response to many things going on in the 60s that seemed to suggest that was a lack of hope in the world. At that time, people were protesting the war in Vietnam, the civil rights movement was in full swing, nuclear threat was around, and the ecological fallout of that was rampant, and everyone was worried about that, and the world felt hopeless to many people. And Moltmann thought that the Christian church did very little to address that hopelessness. As Moltmann saw it, hope in Christian terms was always referring to salvation and life after death. A hope in the coming of the new creation, the, the new kingdom of God in heaven, not here on earth. He thought it was a disservice to believe that our only hope is in the afterlife. So Moltmann wrote his theology outlining how Christians could reclaim hope in the present moment. A hope that God's promises would be revealed through God's people now. Moltmann believed that hope was not just an opium of the beyond, but instead was a power of life that makes us come to life. And he said if we lack hope, we do very little to create helpful change in the world. Moltmann saw that people had no hope for society or for politics or the earth, and so people were completely neglecting it ready to abandon it all to destruction, waiting for that new world, that new heaven to come. And Christianity seemed to be at the front lines leading that charge. And in his work as a professor, Moltmann saw this stark contrast between what he called the pious students and the justice-oriented students. And Moltmann saw that the pious students, who felt connected to God and their faith, were failing to show up and care for the world. But he also saw that the students who were willing to protest and fight for the least of these among us failed to feel connected to their God. So Moltmann longed for a hope that could both feed us spiritually, but also encourage us to go out into the world and fight for the world we want here and now. Not a blind hope, but a hope that brings forth the kingdom of God today. A hope that believes in the life-saving work of God through Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit alive in each and every single one of us. Moltmann was a bit of an optimist, hoping that things would get better. And in an interview, he had a quote that I loved. He said, I think I'm an optimist because otherwise I would be a pessimist. <laughs> That's such a good line. I should get that tattooed on me. I love that. And he said that he can be an optimist and have hope because of his ingrained pessimism. But this optimism of his was based in the hope of the good news of the gospel of Jesus that overcomes the collective pessimism we may be experiencing ourselves, which includes the triumph of grace over sin, the triumph of love over hatred, and the triumph of hope over a hopeless world. Central theme in Moltmann's book called The Theology of Hope was promise. The Christian faith is lived, Moltmann argues, in witness to the promises of a God who can and will make all things right. Ooh, even just saying that feels like, oh, the promises of a God who can and will make all things right. And these promises are offered most clearly in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, according to Moltmann. And this life-giving nature of Jesus reveals to us that God is actively showing up in life-saving ways in our world, right before our eyes. We hope because God is being revealed all around us, even in the midst of some of the worst things that we can imagine. It reminds me of Mr. what Mr. Rogers says about looking for the helpers in the times of pain and suffering. For the helpers are God in the world. And that is why we can help. To Moltmann, hope is the expectation that God will heal and transform the world, which is not meant as a way of denying suffering or injustice. Rather, hope is based in what God has promised us to do. 
Hope is believing that God will show up as God has promised us. Even if that means we have to show up and be God's hands and feet in the world. This morning we read from one of the Psalms, Psalm 42. Thank you, Paula, again. It was beautiful. And I think it captures this opposing nature of hope and hopelessness that many of us probably experience in our lives. And I think it does it in such a poetic way. It starts with its desire to know God like a deer longing for water. For the psalmist says that they are on a diet of tears. Suffering is all they know, and they just want to be with God and find sustenance and relief from their pain. But even those around them are tormenting them, saying, Where is that God of yours? Won't they come save the day for you? Why does this good and benevolent God refuse to show up for you, even if you are so faithful? These are the things that the psalmist and us are left to ponder. Why are we suffering? And where is God in it all? The psalmist asks, why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix your eyes on God. And how do we do this? How do we fix our eyes on God? Well, we remember the promises of God. Promises like those found in the book of Jeremiah 29, 11, which states, For I know the plans I have for you, declares our God. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. This is the God I believe in and that I think we believe in. A God who shows up in the midst of the pain and suffering in the bad days of the world and offers us pieces of hope, of life, a plan for a future that is better than our past. So we must keep our eyes peeled for the hope. For God is at work all around us, reminding us of God's promises. This actually reminds me of some graffiti that you may have seen around Austin. This is a picture of that. You drive around this neighborhood, and honestly most of central Austin, I think it's even beyond, I think it's <coughs> Austin. And you'll see a simple word plastered all around. And that word is buscar. Some of the graffiti art is more ornate than others. This is one that's probably a little more ornate. But most of, us, most of it is just that one simple word, buscar. And what does buscar mean? Well, in Spanish, buscar means to search for, or to seek, or to find. And this unknown graffiti artist has put this word all around us. And if you are going about your regular day normally, you probably have missed it a lot. But let me tell you, it is not subtle. It is everywhere. You probably have already seen it hundreds of times on buildings and sidewalks, overpasses, and telephone poles. It is hard to miss once you see it, once your eyes are opened to its reality. So this is your task once you leave here. See how many times you'll see it this week. It's everywhere. And much like hope, if you are not looking for it, you won't see it, even if it is already there. But if we search it out, who's God? We will find this graffiti all around us, calling us to continue to search for more. I'm not really sure what the intentions of the artists were, but I like to think that they were doing it on purpose. I find it striking that this word has become a bit of a seek and find in Austin. And I like to think that the artist is doing it as a sign to keep searching so we don't miss out on the art all around us. And I think the same goes for hope. When we are looking for hope, we will find it in the places it has already been, right in front of our busy eyes. If we buscamos, if we seek out hope collectively, if we believe in a God who promised us a better future, we will find it. Because it's already happening in front of our eyes. Yes, maybe in some small ways. But hope is alive. And we will find it all over the place, even places it doesn't or shouldn't belong, but yet it is still there, graffitied onto our world. Journey things can feel dark and heavy and intense. Bad days will happen, it is inevitable. But I challenge all of us to believe in a God who would not leave us to suffer alone, but instead is right in the midst of it with us, bringing forth hope and a better future. 
So keep your eyes open, even when you are down in the dumps, crying the blues, as the psalmist says. For God is ready to put a smile on your face. Be that through a friend, a kind word, a puppy dog kiss, or a word graffitied all over town. Hope is alive. Let us use that hope to keep us present to a world that needs us to show up and be God for one another, and be that source of hope that we all are longing for. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Well, God, we lift all these prayers up to you, and we thank you for giving us a community who will hold our hands and keep us up whenever we are struggling. We can also celebrate it with us when we need it as well. So thank you, God. Amen. Okay, maybe Louis is over now. But we have one more song before we get our last blessing from Joe. Um, and this song is called Kyrie Eleison, which means Lord have mercy. Yes. Um, so in the song, it'll say, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. That means, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Um, so, let us sing.
I want to say, Joe has offered a blessing. Most Sundays he's been here, if not all of them, honestly. Um, and it's something that's almost like, oh, he's a pastor here, right? And I was like, no, he's just some dude who showed up. And we like <laughs> give the mic. And every week he blesses us and sends us out of the world. And while we have blessed him to send him out of the world, we've got to give one last good Joe blessing before you leave. So. Yes. So here it is, folks. <laughs> oh, it's a word. It's also a name. It's everything. Hope is better than despair. It's also a seed that can grow in almost, well, grows in every soil. And the soil that we have is before each one of us as we look upon one another, whether they be part of this faith community or others. That seed of hope is sown freely and springs eternal. There's an old hymn that I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. It says, Turn your eyes upon the Savior, the full of his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So take that glory and grace and know that journey will travel north. <laughs> because one of the things they want me to do besides a youth outreach program for marginalized youth is to have an alternative service. And oh boy, are they in for a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so go in peace. <laughs>